Hi, I'm DJ Ghetto Steve, and welcome to my channel. Welcome back if you've been here before. Um, today we are going to be looking at another curriculum for homeschool. Uh, this was actually the Institute in Basic Life Principles, the Bill Gothard uh, movement. They have wisdom booklets uh, that you use for homeschool. So they're, they're workbooks that are based on the Beatitudes speech that, that Jesus did. They basically take a, a section of that speech from Jesus and then they expound on it in a number of different ways in order to teach different subjects. So I want to say thanks to Homeschoolers Anonymous. Uh, they have put together this beautiful archive where you can see all of the wisdom booklets that have been used over the years. Hasn't really changed much in the last few decades. Uh, but yeah, they have the full whole gallery of, uh, of wisdom booklets, so quite a bit to go over. I want to take a look at two things. Uh, we're going to look at the kind of the info packet that comes with all of it that tells you about the style of teaching and what they're trying to accomplish. And then there is also a an actual wisdom booklet that we'll take a look at. So all of this is about teaching your children to discern God's will in every facet of their lives. That is the main goal. So when we're looking at an education, they're not as concerned with ability to spell or read or do higher math or understand science as much. The main point is to discern God's will in every decision. So this goes over quite a bit. It's a very long introduction. Um, it does talk about some specific doctrine that I want to take a look at. Now, they of course say that the problem with today's youth uh, is that there is not enough God in society, not enough God in school, etc. So we are having problems with youth crime, drugs, gangs, domestic violence, broken marriages, unwed mothers, STDs, and a host of other social tragedies that can be traced directly to the removal of an absolute standard of right and wrong. So of course they're making the argument that those who do not have their specific faith do not have a grasp of right and wrong. So they believe that, you know, everything should be based on the law of God and the Ten Commandments and make everything very black and white. You know, what is allowed by God, what is not allowed by God. They talk about some of the early church, some of the early church beliefs and, you know, Greek dualism and how that has influenced the church. And they, they go after St. Augustine. I personally like St. Augustine. But anyways, uh, he sought to merge the philosophies of Plato and the teachings of Christ. That is correct. Uh, he constructed a distinction between the contemplative life, which included church activities, and active life, which involved the earthly pursuits. So... I mean, that, that is true. He, he made a, a distinction in the different parts of man. Uh, but I, I don't think it's fair to say that he thought there were parts of your life that God did not affect. You just had the basic acts in your life that you did because they needed to get done. And then you had other things that were intentionally spiritual. But, of course, Bill Gothard is saying that's a problem. You need to be intentionally spiritual in everything. So we know God by a number of different ways. And I actually agree with some of this. We know God by the meanings of his names. This I completely agree with. The different names of God that are used throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, all have very particular meanings. They communicate different attributes of God. 
God the Father, God the Savior. So, you know, within the Jewish nation, we had Jehovah Jireh, God who provides, Jehovah Rophe, God who heals, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner, Jehovah Makadesh, which is I am the Lord which sanctifies you, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord send peace, uh, Jehovah Siddikenu, the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is my shepherd, Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there. So, you know, very specific attributes of God that are communicated just through the name that we give that person. It's very similar to, you know, I have, I have best friends in my life and I kind of labeled them. I had my nesty bestie, which was my roommate. So, you know, nested together. I also have a mental health bestie. So, you know, I, I have different, different titles for my besties. And that kind of tells you a little bit about my relationship with them. Uh, this, this is the same, the same concept, but on a much more deep and spiritual level. We know God by his associations. This, I, I, it's true to a certain extent, um, because, you know, God identifies himself as God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, he is the God of Elijah, Daniel, Esther, Mordecai. Uh, he has, you know, revealed himself to those persons and identified himself as being associated with those people. So in a sense, you know, we know that those are kind of God preferred people, God honored people, um, and so their, their biographies and their actions and everything are something that is good for us to emulate. Um, however, you're also going to have colloquially a lot of other associations that God gets mixed up in that I really don't think God actually intends to associate himself with. We know God by his judgments. This is... Uh, a portion that I, of course, have issues with. Uh, so he must deal with the transgressions of men. So he he has to be just. He has to execute uh, judgments on people. And so that is why hell must necessarily exist and certain people must go there. We're not going to get into predestination, but, you know, they, they believe that in order for God to be loving, he must also be just. And so therefore must not only carry out blessings, but curses. We know God through his son, Jesus Christ. And so, of course, this is soteriology. Their biggest component of getting a kid down the right path is to get them saved. Uh, so, you know, they need to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is something that I have talked about in a lot of deconstructioners groups and homeschool groups about how as we were raised, things were very black and white. Uh, there, there really wasn't a lot of gray area for anything. It was either correct or evil. And there was no in between. And then you get out into the real world and we all find that there's almost nothing but gray in the real world. There really isn't a lot of black and white. So it's kind of hard to function in the real world after you've spent 18 plus years getting told that everything is black and white. Their solution to tell if something is good or evil is to listen to the Holy Spirit and to let your convictions guide you. They have a lot of verses about, you know, making sure that things are done in love, making sure that things are done for the betterment, but obviously not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. So there's this built-in component of you must, it's that work out your faith in fear and trembling kind of thing. So you have to really sit with your own convictions and determine, is this something that God is telling me to do or is this a lust of the flesh? Because it's not a gray area in the middle. It's either holy or it's evil. And kids with anxiety, they're going to struggle with that. And so, of course, God is light. In him, there is no darkness, therefore gray, which 
darkness I would think would be black not gray but you know the ability to tell good from evil is spiritual maturity so you're not using logical reasoning to say x y or z is holy or evil you're using that internal holy spirit guide to tell you if what you are doing or what someone else is doing is good or evil there is a bit of ecclesiastical separation here saying that fellowship among believers is based on walking in light not compromising in gray areas so you got to make sure that the people that you're around are also walking in the light you can't have you know strong relationships with people who live in gray areas so you know there's the isolation and the separation from the rest of society that doesn't necessarily have your particular religious beliefs what i love is that they even make inanimate objects good or evil they use the fig tree at the parable of the fig tree as an example of an immoral uh, object i really struggle with this explanation because it has implications that are are really pretty gross um they say that Jesus cursed the fig tree and it withered from the root because it did not fulfill the good function for which it was designed. There is a lot of discussion about God's design, especially when it comes to women. There is a God-designed uh, place for you in life. There are God-designed things that you need to do. Um, and, and you can't get away from it. You can't say, I would rather do something else because that is your God designed way to be. And it did not fulfill the good function. So what if you are infertile or have a significant disability or, you know, what if you feel like you are not able to fulfill the good function because of something out of your control are you are you just cursed that and of course we go over doing our own will even when it looks good is bad so i agree intentions matter if you are going into something with the intention of misleading or harming you know that's that's a problem but when you're doing something that is for good and, you know, maybe you're you're volunteering at a soup kitchen because you think it'll give you clout because you can post on Instagram about how you were helping out at the soup kitchen, but you still helped out at the soup kitchen. You still helped feed people. So are we really going to quibble that much about why someone wants to volunteer? Obviously, there are there are extreme cases, there are nuances, it's gray area, people. So then we have the realm of gray and amoral was actually at the heart of Satan's temptation to Adam and Eve. So giving people the knowledge of good and evil would be a gray area and something amoral. It is wild to me that a god would intentionally obscure necessary information because in order to follow him you're supposed to discern good versus evil so if we were simply given that knowledge of what is good and evil it would sure make things a hell of a lot easier and then scripture reduces all things to good and evil and that is absolutely correct the scripture does not leave a lot of room for gray areas. There are certainly some mosaic laws that have nuance. Um, there, there are Levitical laws that have nuance. Uh, but most of those are not found in the Bible. They are found in other Jewish writings. So you're not really getting the full picture from scripture because it is going to be making hard line decisions about certain things not everything but certain things now this verse this verse terrorized me as as a kid if i 
If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present in me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, I do. And so this is that, that eternal struggle inside, trying to die to your flesh and do the things that are, are good and holy, but constantly questioning yourself as to, is this truly good? Am I doing this in the spirit of good? Uh, is there some form of evil that I am perpetrating here? It's, again, if you're a kid with anxiety, it's not great. Now, this is, I don't, I don't see this very often at all, at all. This really takes me back. So, we have the tripartite man, the soul, the spirit, and the heart. And each of those are impacted by a different piece of the Trinity, sort of. So, we have the blood of Christ, which cleanses the heart. We have the spirit of God, which empowers our spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then we have the water of the word, which teaches the soul. So we have to have this, this soul knowledge. That's almost more like mental. We, we need to have the mental understanding of the water of the word. And we need to have a heart cleansing of the blood of Christ. And we need to make sure that we are being led by the spirit of God. Because that's the spirit, the conviction that we are listening to inside to determine if something is holy or evil. Okay, so this, of course, focuses on women. So here's how you would, you know, several different perspectives on how to look at a basic decision that you make in your life and the sp potential spiritual repercussions. So we have the principle of design. God designed clothing for four basic purposes, modesty, protection, gender distinction, and occupation. In making choices for clothing, the following question should be asked. Will my choice of clothing violate any of these purposes? The gender distinction thing is... Mm, that is that is quintessential for the fundamentalist evangelicals. It's not something that is new. It, it is not something that they have been harping on only in the last couple of decades with the increase in visibility for trans and non-binary individuals. This is something they've been harping on since women started wearing pants. Uh, then we have the principle of authority. God has ordained four jurisdictions of authority. Remember the jurisdictions on the uh, Duggar show? With each a particular sphere of responsibility. Parental jurisdiction, church jurisdiction, government jurisdiction, and employer jurisdiction. So when selecting clothing for a particular day or occasion, the question should be asked, whose jurisdiction am I under? And will my dress in one area violate principles in any other jurisdiction? So in some cases, yes, you know, your employer may have a dress code. And if you aren't up to dress code, they will send you home without pay and you will have to change and then come back. Uh, government jurisdiction. In most places, you are not allowed to walk around topless or naked, so you have to have some form of clothing on. In order to go to, into most stores and restaurants, you have to have shirt and shoes. Uh, it's funny that pants are not included on those signs, but it's, it's assumed you will have pants on as well. Uh, then we have church jurisdiction, and certainly a church can have its own modesty standards uh it'd be similar to going to a reform synagogue and wearing some nice jeans and a blouse and putting on a kippah 
and then maybe you go to a conservative uh, synagogue and then you wear long sleeves and uh, maybe you wrap instead of wearing a kippah. Uh, then you could go to an orthodox and you would definitely have to be wearing a long dress, covering your arms, covering your clavicle, preferably covering your hair. Um, so, you know, there's, there's different levels of dress that a particular congregation might abide by. And that's fine. You're, you're allowed. You're a private entity. Well, <laughs> private tax free entity, but you're allowed to make, you know, decisions about what is expected. And then you have parental jurisdiction. Of course, kids are always under your parents. That that umbrella of protection starts with the father and then the mother and then the children are beneath. So obviously got to listen to your parents as far as what you wear outside. And I certainly remember some some arguments with my parents about stuff that I wanted to wear when I was in high school. I was a runner. I was a long distance runner and I really wanted comfortable running clothes. And the ones that are available from sporting companies, not not the most modest. Uh, there's certainly more options now than there were in the mid 90s, but it's it's still typically workout clothes are are not seen as modest. Uh, so yeah, there was definitely some arguments there. And then we have the principle of a clear conscience. The Holy Spirit is given to every believer in order to help him or her discern what is right or wrong. When choosing a dress, a person will often have a caution from the Holy Spirit that this clothing would not be appropriate or would be offensive to others. To override this caution would be to fail the test of acting in faith. So we should therefore ask, do I have any cautions in my conscience that this is not appropriate to wear? And I can certainly appreciate looking in the mirror as you're getting ready to go out and it is, it is not the outfit that you thought, or it doesn't look like you thought it was going to look when you took it off the hanger and you're like, Ooh, no, we're not going to watch this. Let's, let's put something else. But it's this, this internal struggle again that they're trying to cultivate to where you are saying, is this feeling that I have about this outfit that I have on, is that a leading from the Holy Spirit? Am I submitting to lusts of the flesh in wearing XYZ? And you just want to have that constant struggle because if you keep them guessing, it's a little easier to control them. Then you have the, the principle of suffering. Social pressure can be very strong to follow fads and wear symbolic clothing that communicates inappropriate messages. To stand alone in wearing modest and classic clothing, which never goes out of style, may bring ridicule and rejection. This has always been the cost of doing what is right. Therefore, to pass this test, we must ask, am I committed to pleasing the Lord and being an example of appropriate dress rather than surrendering to the pressures of the world? So, of course, they are making the assumption that if you choose to dress in a way that is not trendy or revealing, you're going to be suffering. And this is a godly suffering. So you're supposed to glory in your suffering because you are doing it for God. Then we have the principle of ownership. The mature believer is to view himself as a steward of all he owns, including his clothing. As such, proper care should be given to keep clothing clean and protected from damage. 100% agree with this. Take care of your stuff. It, it, it's expensive out there. Living in America is expensive. Treat your stuff right. Then we have the principle of moral purity. Each of us is responsible to wear clothing that will not stir up lustful desires in other people, nor should we ever wear clothing that communicates immoral messages or sensual symbols. Such clothing would be defrauding and would receive the judgment of the Lord. The question to ask at this point is, will my clothing stir up lustful desires in others or cause them to commit mental adultery? Yeah, 
So the Bible also says if your eye offends you to gouge it out, if your hand offends you, chop it off. Uh, there has to be accountability on others to not be pervs, uh, to control their lustful desires. I mean, if we're supposed to be dying to the flesh and not submitting to lustful desires, then why are we allowing, in this example, specifically men, to, I don't want to say encourage, but to accept a level of I'm going to sexually objectify you and it's your fault because you wore something that was attractive to me. Now, if this was something where only women who are scantily clad have problems with catcalling, sexual harassment, sexual assault, uh, but that's not the case. In many cases, you know, they, they have a march every year for what was she wearing. And women will, will march in this and wear the things that they wore when they were assaulted. And it's perfectly normal clothes. A lot of times it's incredibly covering. It is not sensual. It is not seductive. It is not inviting those types of thoughts or actions. It is just people who are pervs are going to be pervs. And so, you know, as your own self, you can decide, do I want to wear something that is more likely than this other outfit to invite catcalling? Or do I not want to bother? Do I, do I not want to deal with that stress? And then we have the principle of the life calling. Our choice of clothing should be consistent with the fulfillment of the life calling God has given to each one of us. This is the uh, dress for the job you want. If you want to be a stay-at-home mom that homeschools their kids, goes to church all the time, does awanas, etc., then you probably want to dress a little bit differently than someone who wants to become a lawyer or a uh, as someone who has only fans. <laughs> so, you know, there's there's going to be be different outfits for different jobs. You know, again, jobs have dress codes. Um foolish fads can be especially damaging as the scripture states, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor, so death a little folly that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Will this clothing be in harmony with the calling God has placed upon my life? There is an immense pressure for Christian teens and young adults to find their calling within Christ. So whether that is to become a minister or it is to become a teacher, uh, to go into music ministry, whatever it is, you're supposed to find that spiritual life calling. For the more fundamentalists, this could be, you know, I want to be a wife and mother. So you're going to, you know, do those things that will push you towards that particular life. Um, and, you know, when it is a, a genuine choice, that's fine we can all have different lives. It's totally fine. So now we talk about God's callings. So there are general callings, which is what he calls all believers to do. So to be baptized, to go forth and teach all nations, uh, to engage in prayer and intercession and supplications, to take care of the fatherless and the widows. So those are all things that God calls all Christians to do. Now, there are also specific callings, and this is what I was talking about. You know, the uh, specific group of people such as divorced couples, troubled youth, single parent families, business leaders, handicapped individuals, elderly people. A believer's fulfillment and joy will result from the fruit of his life calling. And that's great. You can have a passion and find fulfillment through that. That's wonderful. People do that all the time with or without God. So then uh, we're going to get into some of the appendixes that goes over several different doctrinal points. Um, 
there's a lot of discussion of law and whether things are legalistic or if they are just part of the new covenant through Jesus Christ. And so, you know, we've got the different uh, replacements, basically, in Christ's law of love for the different laws that were found underneath the Mosaic law. And it is meant to be a fulfillment of the Mosaic law to then move into Christ's law. And so that's where they say Christ is the end of law because you're ending the Mosaic law. But they even call it Christ's law of love here. So it's it's still law. That is the black and white because legal has to do with black and white and figuring out all of the particulars in a nuanced case uh, to come to a very clear determination. And so by calling it a law, calling it a spiritual law, you are then just reinforcing that this is correct and everything else is evil. Here's an interesting part. I did not expect to see some of this. Uh, so grace, which is the power to apply God's law. Grace is given to us by God. We cannot earn grace. It is a free gift of God. It is given to everyone. Uh, hath appeared to all men. So it is not limited. Granted, grace is not atonement. But grace is how we approach atonement. We, we receive atonement by repenting through the grace that we were given to steer us towards repentance. Grace is given as needed. Grace can be resisted. So in that, that Calvinistic tulip, that is irresistible grace. So these guys are not quite on board with Calvin because grace can be resisted. We can do things that prevents God from helping us. Grace is given to the humble. So of course, don't be a proud person. They go after pride parades every single year just for that choice of wording. Uh, and grace is an active enabling for obedience. So again, grace is steering you towards repentance, towards the, the repentant heart that you need to have with Christ. And then we have the truths on the law. It's, it's a bunch of dialectics. <laughs> so we have, we are delivered from the Mosaic law, but we are guided by the Mosaic law. We are judged apart from the law, because with or without the law, we are sinners. We are judged by the law. And I think it's interesting that both judged apart from the law and judged by the law are from the exact same verse in the Bible. So this is not cherry picking verses. This is actually in the same statement. They said we are both judged apart from the law and by the law. The law is inadequate. And that is why Jesus had to come. That is why the Mashiach needed to be here. And the law is perfect because it is created by God and therefore it cannot be wrong. The law is for sinners because it is what governs the unrighteous, the reprobate, that do not have the steering of the Holy Spirit to will them to do good. It is also for saints because no matter how long you've been saved and what you do in your life, you are still a sinner at heart. The law brings death because it condemns people to death. And the law is good because it says it's good. So that is the introduction. Let's move on to one of the actual uh, wisdom booklets. So like I said, this is all based on Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew's chapter five through seven. And this is how it's going to break things down. So we first realize the importance of learning this character quality. Why is the character quality discussed in the verse important? We're gonna memorize the operational definition. So we're gonna have a little bit of English memorization, words, adding to vocabulary. We are going to identify the quality in scripture. So there's gonna be reading. Uh, expand with synonyms and antonyms, so more linguistics practice. Uh, balance with related qualities. 
So just discussing how one good character quality is related to another good character quality. So fostering one will help you foster others. They are going to list when and where that quality is to be used. Because obviously not everything is to be used in every situation. So you're going to want to have a little bit of tact and grace in how you do things. Um, then we have design guidelines to learn the quality. So they're going to give them some, it's not quite a worksheet, but they'll give them some questions, some activities to go over uh, learning that quality and the guidelines of that quality. Turn problems into character classes. So if you have an argument, a dispute, etc., you're going to turn that into a character lesson about how one should best act within a particular situation. That is great. I think that's fantastic. The problem is this is going to be very, this is where we get into the ecclesiastical separation problem, the, the creating isolation for the homeschool kids, because they are told to apply these characteristics to other children and hold them to basically an adult standard of holiness as children um and they're gonna say you shouldn't make friends with these kids that don't act right uh you should only be around those that are holding the same standard of living then we have evaluate progress uh at the end of the week place the names of all the family members in a hat have each family member draw a name and answer the following questions and so this is all about um, how did our family members over the course of the week implement the character quality into their lives. So we're not evaluating their progress as far as how well they understand grammar or science or geography. We're just going to make sure they've got this character trait. So in Wisdom Booklet 1, it's Matthew 5, 1. So it is simply, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And they're going to extrapolate a lot out of this using other kind of companion uh, passages to talk about why this portion of a sentence is important. It's, it's true or false questions here that the kids are, are being asked. Uh, in relationship to what Jesus was doing on the Mount as he started the Sermon on the Mount. There's a little hymn included here. And then we get into how it applies to the various subjects of school. So first we have a basic uh, outlay of, you know, we train our eyes to see what is important to us. Wisdom is training our eyes to see what is important to God because God was looking at the multitudes. And then in linguistics, rather than focusing on English grammar, spelling, etc., you learn a bunch of Greek. And again, Greek is great. If you want to take that as an elective, awesome. Foreign languages are so helpful. It helps your brain to think in different ways and it can really improve other uh, subjects in, in schoolwork. So, you know, language is great, but you should probably learn your own language as well. And then we have history. So it's going to talk about the specific place in history where Jesus did this speech. And so we have the, you know, the diagrams of the geography layout. And then since we're talking about seeing under science, chemistry, biology, astronomy, geology, physics, and mathematics, mathematics is lumped in under science. So we're going to talk about the eye and issues of the eye. And then under law, government, economics, and logic, uh, we're going to talk about how that is demonstrated. So we have, you know, it's law. So we're talking about God's law. So it's God's law about mountains. And then we have under medicine, 
which is health, nutrition, behavior, and counseling. We are talking more about the eye and what you see, but it's also talking about how that interacts with other systems within your body. So for example, if you see a child in the window of a burning building, your brain is going to release adrenaline into your bloodstream. That's how, you know, people who like a kid gets run over and they have superhuman strength to pick up the car. That's the adrenaline. Uh, so then we have a example of, of blood circulation at different elevations. Cause again, we got to work this into the mountain. We got to work this into scene. So we're going to talk about oxygen levels cause that's health. Uh, so then we have our quizzes and next to each question, it tells you where to find the answer. Not, not the best on quizzes to, to always be open book. Uh, then we have a mathematics section where they have, let's see, one, two, three, uh, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, I think we have ten. Ten math problems throughout all of this. Uh, so we have some basic division, some multiplication, and then division. And then we have multiplication, division, and subtraction. Uh, percentages. So this is all actually somewhat advanced math. The the percentages, at least, I, I would put above. Because I know I didn't learn that until much later in, in elementary school. That wasn't a, wasn't a third grade thing. Um, so these books are intended to work at basically any age level. Um, so it's going to skew like some young kids are going to really struggle with the math because it's it's above, you know, the times tables or or basic addition and subtraction that they're used to. You know, they they have some algebraic uh, stuff where to go. There it is. Algebraic stuff. So it's such a mixed bag and not nearly enough instruction on how to do these problems you are simply given the problems and and basically a word problem from the passage but but not any actual instruction on how to do these math problems and you'll notice they'll say without scripture as the guiding rule man tends to misuse mathematics to his own purposes which leads to destruction and of course they they point out statistical data in medicine, which is studied without reference to God's laws, encourages some doctors to perform surgery on patients who do not have cancer. Exploratory surgery is often based on probability tables, which exclude vital health factors found in the scriptures. Now, I don't know about you, but I am absolutely going to be jumping for joy if my surgeon is basing the care that he is giving me on statistical analysis of what is going to be the most effective treatment for what I have been diagnosed with, uh, rather than going to the Bible for health factors. I mean, this may as well tell me that I need to bleed some humors because that's about the level of medicine that was going on at the time. Actually, I don't even think the humors had been uh, uh, identified. I mean, they don't exist, but you know, the, the determination of their being humors happened much, much after the Bible was written. So yeah, it's, it's bad. And then we have, um, examples of when things are used correctly and when things are done wrong. So remember when it was talking at the beginning about how you can, do evil things even though it looks good because you have the wrong intention you have the wrong spirit behind it and so we have a, a moment where the pen was used for good 
and then a place where the pen was used for bad, because Karl Marx, bad. And then we have a basic grammar exercise uh, where you have kind of a Mad Libs situation going on and you have to decide which synonym and antonym uh, fits in each blank. So we're not discussing spelling. We're not discussing grammar. We are simply filling in the blanks to what sounds the best based on the conversations that we have had with others in our life. And so the more isolated you are, the less likely you are to have had conversations that use an expanded vocabulary. Now, they go over discernment versus judgment, because of course, there's the voice that, or there's the verse that says, judge not lest ye be judged. So we can't judge, we just need to make sure it's discernment. Making that spiritual distinction is a big deal, because you can sit on your high horse and say whatever you want, as long as you can call it discernment. Uh, now, there are those who would certainly say that even secular people have a distinction between judgment and discernment. Like I can look at someone who is doing something incredibly stupid and go, yeah, that's, that's not going to turn out well. And I can tell someone, Hey, you know, I, I noticed that your tire is flat. You, you really should get your tire replaced, like pull it over so you're not driving on a flat tire. That's discernment. Uh, judgment would be, oh, your car has rust spots. You really need a better car. Or I can't imagine buying a car that's more than five years old. That's judgment. Because <laughs> then you're, you're placing effectively, in a secular sense, it's not a moral judgment, but it's a social acceptance judgment like this is not a socially acceptable way to act or way to be um and and so we're making a judgment about that person that either dehumanizes them or demeans them uh because we simply think that we are better and we know better uh, that's if this judgment is is saying oh my oh i can't believe you got an android iphone is so much better discernment is looking at your upgrade options with your wireless carrier and determining what is going to meet your needs and not break the bank and you know you you do the best you can so <laughs> Uh, that's that's where we are with discernments and judgment. Uh, now we have a little bit more looking at discernment and how to make these decisions. So we have general observations. So things that are obvious and without question. So a woman walking towards the store, I noticed that she was wearing a blue dress. So blue dress is, is a fact. That is a general observation. Then we have general distinctions, and that's relationships and conditions that are obvious from the initial observations. I was able to distinguish a father walking into the store with his two little children. However, if you see a grown man walking into a store with multiple children, it could be his children, it could be his nieces and nephews, it could be someone he is babysitting or a manny for, uh, it is not necessarily the father. So, so these things you can't, you know, it may be obvious to you that there is a particular connection between person A and person B, but there, there is no actual proof of that uh, until you actually talk to the person and ask them. Then we have specific perceptions, and that is inward attitudes that are reflected from outward evidences. So if you see someone who is unhappy, he will have a certain expression on his face. Uh, he had a low self-esteem of himself by the way he dressed in his appearance. Or he could have been poor. His eyes and dress allowed me to perceive that he had a spirit of rebellion toward authority. Where did we get that? 
where did we get that? Someone is unhappy and unkempt, and so therefore they are rebellious? This is the kind of judgment that does not need to happen. This is not discernment. This is judgment. Because you're taking something that you do not know about the person. You are looking at outward factors and making a moral judgment about that person's motivations for acting in a given way, as well as what type of actions you could expect from them. There is a Bible verse that says that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. I would like to see more of that in sermons like this, in publications like this. We, we rely too much on assumptions in society, and that has been a problem for time immemorial. There are always misunderstandings and things that need to be corrected after you talk to somebody because your first impression of them was something very different. So then we have precise discernments, basic needs that are obvious from the observations, distinctions, and perceptions. So this is the, the judgment that they come to. The young woman walking towards the store has an attire of an immoral woman and needs to gain moral freedom. I also discern from the hardness of her facial features that she needs to overcome bitterness towards those who have wronged her. So we're making all sorts of assumptions of what has happened in this woman's life and how she has responded to it based on the way that she dresses and the look on her face. This is where women get told you need to smile more. And it's bullshit. We do not need to smile more. We smile plenty when we want to. But we're supposed to have this countenance that gives off godly love and grace and movement in the Holy Spirit. So you're supposed to be able to tell that someone is Christian by the way that they look. But again, man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. God would know if she had bitterness. God would know if she needed freedom of some sort. And if God is an all-powerful God, he can do it without you judging her. Now, mature comprehension, understanding the causes and relationships between outward symptoms, inward attitudes, and basic needs, and suggesting steps to remove the root causes of problems. The little boy does not honor his father. Perhaps the father has broken the boy's spirit by disciplining him in anger. The father could overcome his anger by yielding his rights to God and developing a meek and quiet spirit. He could begin to heal his little boy's broken spirit by recognizing how his anger has wounded him and asking his boy to forgive him and pray for him to be the father that he should be. So because we have a boy who is unhappy and unkempt, he must have a broken spirit because his father has anger issues. Where are we getting this? This is, this is outrageous to make these assumptions. And I mean, sure, people do this all the time. They'll look at homeless people and make assumptions about how they got there. But that's not something we should be fostering as a, a holy... Uh, a holy discipline, a, a holy behavior that it's just wild. And then we get into languages. So you would think maybe now we'll get into grammar or anything else English related. Nope. We're going to talk about the fall of Babylon and the dispersal of humans into different uh, language groups. Now you'll notice the language groups that are here, if you Google language groups, these are not the ones that are listed and there's many more than 10. I think there's 19 actually. But they, they use old terminology that is riddled with racism and colonization. So that's fun. 
and then we have um you know a distribution of who speaks what languages and then you know greek is down here for some reason not that it's related to germanic or indo or indo iranian uh but it's it's there i'm guessing alphabetically from what i can tell um it it really has very interesting notes here because we have the romance languages that is all correct and i believe that's still the word for them today and we have the indo-iranian so this is going to be your southeast asian uh spots we have germanic uh scandinavian is in multiple countries with slightly different dialects uh then we have different celtic languages yeah i guess uh balto slavic is a whole lot and then we have armenian and albanian which are apparently monoliths onto themselves and have no distinctions between different regions so limited information and of course kids that are using something like this are not going to be given uh, unfettered access to the internet by any means so researching this may or may not be possible and they would have to actually be interested to go looking for it because it's not included in the wisdom booklet it is not suggested in the wisdom booklet um so they're going to talk about languages, why Greek is awesome, and how did God prepare the world to receive the gospel in Greek? Because the the uh, early church letters were written in Greek. Uh, so, you know, the reason why Greek was a powerful language at the time was because God was going to use it to uh, transmit the Bible. Nothing else. It's, it's just God, you know. And then we get back into Greek. So we have different Greek words, how to spell them, what are the names of the letters, how do you pronounce them. And that's great if you want to learn Greek. Then we have Greek sentence analysis. So we're getting grammar, but it's Greek grammar. And then we have geography, and so we're going to talk about geography of the promised land. Then using that tiny little map, you're supposed to use that to answer questions about distances from places, uh, as the crow flies, of course. And then we have uh, descriptions of cities, uh, not necessarily a geographical description, but a, a social scriptural uh, description of that particular place. Uh, more of that with regions and, oh, I guess they do have a larger um, map for you to work off of. That's good because that tiny one was ridiculous. Now we go back to vision because remember under science and uh, medicine, we were talking about vision. So God uses spiritual vision, man uses physical vision. They, they don't include the verse that I was talking about earlier about how man looks at the outward appearance and God looks at the heart. Um, I believe this diagram is trying to say that you can see people with spiritual vision if you look to God, I think. Um, having eyes see ye not, and having ears hear ye not, and do ye not remember. So this is the metaphorical to see, the metaphorical opening of your eyes, opening of your ears, and being receptive to something that is, is being broadcast to you because they seen with their physical eyes see not with their spiritual eyes uh then we're going to talk about different uh ways that sight can be corrupted through medicine uh well the medicine is not what corrupts it but the medical description of of how it is abnormal so we have myopia hyperopia <laughs> nearsighted farsighted um and so we have a lot of talk about how that can affect our spiritual life what kind of of 
nearsightedness or farsightedness can we have to spiritual issues in our life? A uh, lazy eye, astigmatism, that's what I've got. Uh, but uh, yeah, it just goes over these different things and how it relates to your spiritual life. So again, we're not really learning much about the body. We've got some basic uh, descriptions of the parts of the eye. Um, but but yeah, it's it's very limited because it's just a little a little booklet i was saying uh it, you you see moms the kid got run over and so the mom picks up the car so they can pull the kid out uh several years ago a man named arnold had a heart attack after he recovered the doctor told him not to pick up heavy objects but one day he saw a five-year-old boy playing in some cast iron pipes 18 foot long pipe rolled in the bubble the boy tumbled under it. The pipe weighing 1,800 pounds rested on the trap boy's head. And so because he had this massive adrenaline surge, he was able to pick up the pipe. Uh, when Arnold went back to try and pick up the pipe, he could not lift it. Neither could anyone else. And so, you know, that adrenaline surge can push us to do things that would not otherwise be physically possible. So here we're talking about different reactions that our body has to things that we see. Although it's not really the reaction to the things that we see. It is a reaction to the emotions that we feel when we see something. Is something frightening to us? Is something alarming to us? Is something comforting to us? Uh, so what we see and the emotions that we have attached to it... Um, how does that impact our physical response? And then let's see, we have a Bible verse quiz and a really bad diagram about the nervous system. Wow. So when I was in high school, I actually may have gotten it in junior high. But at any rate, when I was a tween or a teen, um, I was really interested in medicine. So what was the first book they bought me? Grey's Anatomy. Now that has some phenomenal <laughs> illustrations of the body because it is what has been used in, for medical students for a really long time. So that gets to the end of the wisdom booklet. Uh, so that is the ATI approach, the Advanced Training Institute of America, which is underneath the IBLP uh, Institute and in Basic Life Principles. So uh, that is what we're going to go over at the moment. I do want to mention that I did get one of the seminar books for the Institute and in Basic Life Principles. Uh, so I will definitely be doing a uh, video here shortly going over what I found in that. Uh, it happens to be the men's uh, seminar booklet rather than the women's. So it, it should be very interesting because I'm very familiar with what was broadcast to women, talking to women who have been to those seminars. I'm really curious to see what is communicated to the guys. Always interesting to see the other side. So thank you so much for coming along today and I hope to see you again.